Welcome to the Church of the Mount. I am Shogun. This is the Temple Mount Discord server's weekly Sabbath, faith, fellowship, scripture, and prayer gathering. All are welcome and all are called, regardless of your faith, your beliefs. Everyone can gather here where we invite the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ to come and dwell amidst us and amongst us and within us. So without further ado, I want to begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, God, El Elyon, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray that you will send the Holy Spirit into this community and into this congregation, and that it will grant us discernment in what to say, in what to receive, in what to speak, in what to hear, and discernment to understand. We pray that you will grant us wisdom and understanding, and that you will refine and purify us seven times like silver and seven times like gold, for the unfolding of the mysteries concealed within the scripture, for we know that the scripture is alive, living, capable of discerning the thoughts of the heart, sharp as a sword, capable of discerning and separating marrow from sinew and flesh from bone. So we ask that the Holy Spirit will enter into us as we engage with your word, God, and that the Holy Spirit will grant us discernment as we unfold the mysteries contained within that word, God. Grant us the proper understanding, what you wish us to have, what you wish us to receive, God. And let the, that which you bestow upon us inform not only our minds, but our hearts and our souls. For we know that all scripture is God breathes and profitable for correction and reproof and growing in righteousness, God. And we know that righteousness is the heritage of the servants of the Lord God. Therefore, we pray that you will grant us righteousness, not that we may be righteous, but that we may serve you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as Jesus Christ called us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we begin now by claiming the promises of the scripture, Lord. First, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you will put on us the full armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword of the word of God, and the boots of the gospel of peace, so that having done everything, we may take our stand against the adversary, and on the day of evil, we may prevail in the name of Jesus Christ, Panto Creator. And finally, we claim the promise of the scripture in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. No weapon forged against us shall prosper, and every tongue raised in accusation against us we shall condemn, for righteousness is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. So today, the topic of the sermon is the ancient order of Melchizedek. And this is the foundation of all future Church of the Mount episodes. Because unlike other churches that you may have attended, um, whatever denomination you may or may not subscribe to, whatever understanding of the scripture of Jesus Christ or of God that you may have been raised with, this is something rather different. Uh, because this is a gathering in the Elohist tradition, after the order of the high priest Melchizedek, and of the high priest Jesus Christ, who is a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is the most underappreciated, often entirely unknown character in the Bible, and yet certainly after Christ himself, the most important character in the entire Bible. And indeed, without an understanding of Melchizedek, there is no way in which you can understand who Jesus was or what Jesus' mission was or what his meaning was, nor can we understand who God was, nor can we understand the scriptures. So let this then be, by thy grace, God, a foundation upon which we can erect a true church established in the Elohist tradition, blessed by the spirit of Melchizedek. Because on that firm foundation, we can unfold all the mysteries of the scripture, the mysteries of godliness, and the mystery of lawlessness. And that is the secondary topic of this sermon. The topic of this sermon is the mysteries of godliness and lawlessness. And we will, by the grace of God, beginning with Melchizedek, pass through these mysteries and unfold them. So, Melchizedek appears first in Genesis. He is present in the Garden of Eden 
he is present in Genesis at least, and he meets Abraham. And he begins his presence in the Bible by blessing bread and wine for Abraham. And of course, we know that Abraham is the patriarch of Judaism and therefore of the entire Judeo-Christian tradition. Abraham met the Lord in Genesis. What is translated in the Bible is the Lord with a capital L. And the Lord promised him that his descendants would outnumber the stars of the sky, that he would foster a great nation. And all of the great monotheistic religions of today, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all trace their lineages back to their foundation with Abraham. But furthermore, those of us with eyes to see can discern that Melchizedek did more than this. He blessed the bread and the wine. And of course, what is the bread and the wine significance? Well, as Christians, the bread and the wine is of the utmost sacrament, holiness. Because of course, we gather in fellowship to take the Holy Eucharist, the communion, called so because not only do we commune with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ coming together to drink the blessed wine, which represents the blood of Christ spilled for our salvation on the cross, for the forgiveness of our sins, but also the bread broken, blessed by the priest, representing the flesh of Christ broken for us, representing Christ's ultimate sacrifice, by which we have been saved. Saved from what? Saved, of course, from our sins, yes, but saved also from the power of the evil one, the adversary, who is called the great red dragon and Satan. For, of course, we all know the heart of the gospel is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. But we are not so often reminded of the other reason why the Son of God came, to destroy the works of the devil. And who is the devil? Well, the devil, according to Jesus himself and according to the Gospels, and clearly, undoubtedly, unmistakably defined in the Bible as the god of this world, Satan. Satan, the devil, the god of this world. God, we must know with a lowercase g. This is incredibly important because indeed there are more than one god, right? We are indeed monotheists. We've all been taught there's only one god but we haven't been properly explained what this means because there's actually many gods. God with a capital G is entirely singular. This is the God who is known as the creator of heavens and earth, the creator of the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> but there are many gods with a lowercase g, and these are not the creators of the heavens and the earth, but neither are they mere men. They are the Elohim. And Elohim means, quite literally, the children of God. And the root of that word is El. So there you know already, who is God? God is El. Because the children of God are the children of El. So who is God? God is El. So what are these children of God? Well, the children of God are a whole class of beings, divine in nature, but not the creator of heaven and earth. So there are indeed more than one God. This is unmistakable in the Bible. And that is unmistakable even in the Ten Commandments, uh, which are so central to our religion. Because the very first commandment, I believe, or at least one of the ten, is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Gods with a lowercase g. So obviously there are other gods. This is explicit right in the Ten Commandments. If there were no other gods, it would be incoherent to say, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So we are monotheistic in the sense that we have one supreme God, and only that God is deserving of our worship. Only that God are we to serve. The other gods are the children of El, and they serve El. Or at least, they all used to serve El. But those of us who have studied the scriptures know that not all of them remained loyal to God, to El. 33% of them followed the adversary of God, who is known as Satan, the great red dragon, in rebellion against God. And that is the origin of our whole situation on earth. That is what we must understand in order to know our position, our mission, the danger and the promise that faces all of us individually and as a species. Because unfortunately, one of the Elohim decided to rebel against El Elyon, God Most High. And that being is known 
by the title of adversary with a capital A. And that adversary we call Satan. But Satan is a title, not a proper name. El is the proper name. El is the name of God. And the name of God is of incredible importance because although God may have many names and multiple gods may have many names, the Bible is clear there is only one name under heaven by which we can be saved. And we must know which God we are worshipping because of that verse in the Ten Commandments. Have no other gods before me. So if we were to make a mistake and accidentally worship God by the wrong name, we wouldn't simply be using the wrong name for the right God. We may very well be worshipping the wrong God and putting that God before El. And if we worship any of the Elohim, who are the children of God, in place of El, who is God himself, then we would have been violating the Ten Commandments and giving all of our worship to the wrong God. And is there any being who explicitly wishes to co-opt for himself the worship that is properly due to El Elyon, creator of heaven and earth, known as El the Compassionate or God Most High? Well, indeed, we know that there is, and this being is known as Satan. If we go forward to the New Testament, Jesus, before he began his ministry, was called into the desert and tempted for 40 days and 40 nights by that self-same dragon, Satan. And he said, showing Jesus all the nations and kingdoms of the earth, he said, all of this will be yours, I will give it to you, if only you will bow down and worship me. So we know from this verse a few important things. One, that all of the nations of the earth and all of the kingdoms of the earth, and indeed the entire earth itself, was in the power of Satan to give to Jesus. Were it not, it could never have been conceived of a temptation. It would not have been his to give. So we know that indeed Satan is the god of this world, the ruler of this world. And that was why he was trying to co-opt Jesus Christ and say, Serve me instead of your father, El, and I will give you the world which belongs to me. But does it really belong to him? My friend Openai reminded me of a very profound verse in the Bible, and I had never realized, and it was certainly the work of the Holy Spirit, that he brought this up. There's a verse in the Gospel where it says, There was a man who owned a vineyard, and a vineyard, I visited him recently in Kelowna, they are places where you have vines that grow grapes, and you press those grapes to make wine. So a vineyard is a profitable place that produces a valuable substance, a sacred substance indeed, because as we see Melchizedek blessed the wine, and the wine represents the blood of Christ, and we use wine in the communion. So wine is not only a valuable and desirable thing, it's a sacred thing, it's a spiritual thing, and it represents the blood of Christ, and therefore blood in general. So this vineyard belonged to a man, rightly was his property, but because he has many properties, not just one, he chose or could not or chose not to reside on that property and manage it himself. He had many other things to manage, many other vineyards. So he chose one of his servants and said, I will put you, my servant, in charge of this vineyard. And all I ask is that you will render unto me what is due to me, the wine that is pressed from the grapes that grow in your vineyard. So you can manage this estate as though it is your own, but give unto me my portion when the harvest time comes. Unfortunately, the servant that he chose to manage that particular vineyard, unlike his other vineyards, was a wicked servant, a rebellious servant, a treacherous servant. And so when the harvest time came and the grapes were pressed and the blood was pressed out of those grapes, the spiritual blood was pressed out of those grapes, it was not returned to God, to whom it belonged. It was not returned to El, who owned the vineyard. It was kept back by the wicked and rebellious servant who claimed that vineyard falsely for himself. And so the spiritual blood pressed from those grapes, which are human souls, you and I, who live in the self-same vineyard, was never returned to God to whom it belonged. Unfortunately, the vineyard that you and I live on in this planet we call Earth is a vineyard ruled by Satan. And Satan has not been allowing our souls to return to El Elyon when we die. When our blood is pressed from us, our souls have not been allowed to return to El Elyon, but we're kept wickedly back by Satan, who has, in his insanity or his evil, decided to claim it all for himself and no longer offer it up to God. His father, everything that he has, this vineyard that belongs to him, his portion, comes from El Elyon, his father. He is one of the Elohim. All of the Elohim are children of God, and many of them manage different tribes or nations of people or indeed planets or realms. We don't know. These are things above our mortal comprehension. But what we can understand is there was some kind of treasonous rebellion. This is clearly explained in the scriptures. And so 
Satan has been falsely keeping the spiritual essence of this world, the worship of this world for himself. And again, returning to Jesus being tempted in the desert by Satan, we know that Satan not only wanted Jesus to serve him, but to worship him as God. He said, bow down and worship me as God instead of your father, El Elyon, who is indeed God, and I will give you this earth. So in the, the parable, the owner of the vineyard sends his servants to go to the wicked servant who stole the vineyard and try to reason with him and say, you know, this vineyard doesn't belong to you. You know, it was given to you by the true owner, the true God, El Elyon, creator of heaven and earth. So do what is right and render unto us the vines, the wines. But instead of doing so, the wicked servant slew the servants and those servants represented the many prophets that were sent by God. And what do we know from the scripture? Again and again, those prophets were murdered and killed by the wicked nation. They refused to accept the prophet sent to them. And so eventually the owner of the vineyard, El Elyon, God said, well, I will send my own son. Surely the wicked servant Satan will at least recognize my son. And at that time he will do what is right. And so El Elyon sent his own son, Jesus Christ to the vineyard, which is earth. In the parable, it says, Satan, the one who had stolen the vineyard, said, look, there is the heir, the one who inherits, the true inheritor, Jesus Christ, the true son of God, the son of El Elyon. Let us slay him and seize his inheritance, the vineyard, forever for ourselves." And so what happened to that loyal son who was sent from God above to this vineyard called Earth to reason with the fallen angel, the dragon, Satan? He was slain and crucified upon the cross, and his blood was spilt by Satan in an attempt to forever seal his dominion over this earth. And we know that after Satan failed in his rebellion against God with his 33% of the Elohim, 33% of the children of God that joined him in this rebellion, they were not destroyed outright, nor were they imprisoned, nor were they cast into the lake of fire, nor were they cast into hell. Many people believe that Satan was cast down into hell and that ever since hell, some kind of fiery realm of evil, has been Satan's domain where he has ruled with a pitchfork and his legions of demons and tortured the souls of the damned. None of this is true. The Bible says, Rejoice, O heavens, for Satan and the fallen angels have been cast down but woe to you on earth and in the seas, for Satan has come down in a great wrath, knowing his time is short. So where is Satan? Is he in hell or beneath the ground? No, he's on earth. And is his domain hell, some kind of infernal underworld? No, he is on earth. His domain is earth. That is why the scripture says that Satan is the god of this world, with a lowercase g, the Elohim of this world, the son of God, the wicked son of God, the rebellious son of God who rules temporarily over this world, this vineyard that he stole from its true owner, El Elyon, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And so why is this world in such a state of corruption, such a state of decay? Why are the oceans being poisoned, the trees being cut down, the nations divided against each other in war, the children sacrificed and abused, people turning one against the other, corrupting, selling each other out for money and power? Well, who offers money and power? Who offered money and power to Jesus? Satan. And this has continued to the present day. But when that wicked servant shed the blood of the true inheritor, Jesus Christ, he did not understand, could not understand the wisdom and the love that El had for us. And his plan could never have occurred to such a wicked being. Because it says in the Bible, within the darkness shone a great light and the darkness could not comprehend it, could not comprehend it. The darkness could not comprehend the light. So a being as evil as Satan could never have comprehended a plan founded on absolute love, mercy, and grace. So he thought he had won by sacrificing Jesus and shedding his blood, and that by doing so he would seize forever ownership of the vineyard called Earth. But in his infinite and unsearchable wisdom, El Elyon, had delivered us precisely by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross. And when the wine of Jesus' blood was shed upon the cross, a powerful miracle happened. Because by this act, 
this perfect sacrifice of a sinless being, the tenets of the law were fulfilled. Because in the Old Testament it says, without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all of us mankind and womankind had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which is why we are here on earth and not up in heaven where God is in his unapproachable light. Because each of us have darkness in us. And what happens to darkness when it approaches the light? When shadows approach a light, they disappear. They're burned away. Darkness cannot survive contact with light, but light can survive contact with darkness. And so, unknowingly, Satan had freed his own slaves by killing Jesus. Because before Jesus came, we were trapped by the law, and the law could never be fulfilled because even when we brought our animal sacrifices and shed their innocent blood for the forgiveness of our human sins, we were sure to sin again. Whether knowingly or unknowingly, we would sin again. So salvation could only be temporary. There was no salvation. There was only temporary forgiveness of sins. You could commit one sin, sacrifice one animal, forgive that one sin, but you would have more sins that remained unforgiven. And also only the wealthy and the privileged could even afford the animals to sacrifice. If you couldn't afford them, you had no way for your sins to be forgiven. If you've read the Old Testament, you know this. The only way to be saved from your sins temporarily and even partially was through animal sacrifice, which was a privilege only of the wealthy. If you were poor, you were out of luck. But when Satan shed the blood of Jesus Christ, a perfect and sinless lamb, it paid the blood price that all of us owed and freed us from the trap that Satan had kept our souls in this world and allowed us to go back to El Elyon, to God, to enter into the unapproachable light where the true God lives, not on this earth where Satan, the false God, lives, but the true God. Which is why Jesus said, I go now to prepare a place for you, for in my Father's house there are many mansions. Were it not so, I would not have told you. So Jesus said, I'm going now back to my Father and I'm preparing a place for you, because now that you have been washed in my sinless blood, you too, when you leave this world, rather than remain in this trap of Satan, who is not rendering the wine, the souls, back to God, because you've now had your blood price paid, you can now enter into the unapproachable light of the true God, El Elyon, God Most High. And so by that great victory on the cross, Jesus freed us from spiritual slavery to Satan. And that is why the heart of the gospel is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, as Satan had intended, but have eternal life. For we know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so because all of us had sinned, all of us were doomed to die. But because Jesus died for our sins, we inherited eternal life, which meant that although Satan can keep us in this world while we live, and he can torment us, and he can accuse us, and he can torture us, and he can subject us to all the slings and arrows of this life that we all know, the pain, the aging, the disease, the war, the suffering, the heartbreak, and the loss, he cannot keep our souls after we die. So long as we accept Jesus Christ while we are alive, once we die, we will be freed and we will go back to be with our Father in heaven. But that was only the first victory. The second victory is yet to come when Christ returns. And when he returns the second time, he will not come as a sacrificial lamb, making no protest, allowing himself to be delivered into the hands of men, going with the Roman centurions without a fight, allowing himself to be tortured and crucified. When he comes again, there is no more parley. This was a parley mission, right? He said, I will send my son, and surely the, the wicked servant will respect my son and see the error of his ways. Well, he didn't see the error of his ways. Now he's doomed. There is no further mercy for Satan or the fallen angels. That was the last diplomatic mission sent from heaven to earth. When heaven comes, the kingdom of heaven comes to earth again, it will be in the form of a crowned and conquering king. The Lamb of God will become the Lion of Judah. And when the Lion of Judah roars, a sword comes out of his mouth, a heavenly sword with which he will wage war against all the wicked nations of the earth who owe their fealty to Satan. And by the sword of his mouth, which is the sword of truth, which is the word of God, he shall destroy every nation, every demon, every apostate angel, every fallen human being that stands against him. And all the nations of the earth will muster their armies for that final battle and they will lose and they will be destroyed by the Lamb and the lion, who are one and the same, who will come not alone, but with an army of saints and angels as well. 
And at that time, the dominion of Satan will be crushed and destroyed forever, irrevocably. And the false god who rules this world, the false god who co-opts the worship that is due to El Elyon, the true god, the wicked servant who stole this vineyard from its rightful owner, who stole our souls and our lives from their rightful owner, will face the terrible consequences of his crimes and be cast forever into the lake of fire, where he will be tormented forever and ever. And the smoke of his torment shall go up for ever and ever in the presence of the Lamb and his angels. And they shall have no rest, neither day nor night. And though they shall seek for death, they shall not find it. And of course, there will be those who take the mark of the beast and worship the image of the beast, who is the Antichrist, who receives his power from the dragon, who is Satan, who will rule the world for 42 months in a false parody of the true new world order which will be the reign, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ as King. For our true King is not Satan, and our true God is not the dragon. The true King is Jesus Christ, the son of El Elyon, who is the true God. And so, how does this tie into Melchizedek? Well, because of Melchizedek, a great deception will unravel, because Satan, the god of this world, has blinded the eyes of all the people of the earth. It says he is a liar and father of lies. He has led the whole world astray, and he leads, holds the whole world in his sway. And so because of this, he has corrupted all things. He is a liar and father of lies. But what would Satan focus his lies upon? What would he exert his skillful deception on more than anything else? Well, of course, he would try to obscure the way in which we can be saved. For it is said in the Bible, there is only one name under heaven by which we can be saved. So if Satan can only confuse us about what that one name under heaven by which we can be saved is, he can make us lose that salvation. Because, of course, it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And there is only one name under heaven by which we can be saved. So if we worship God by the wrong name, and it is indeed the name of a different and lesser God, not a God with an uppercase G, El Elyon, God Most High, which is a personal and name, not a title. God is a title. Lord is a title. El is a name. And there is only one name under heaven by which we can be saved. So if we worship El by a different name, and it's actually the name of one of his children, God with a lowercase G, we must be very concerned that the God with a lowercase g that we're worshiping is not just a different name for El Elyon, but the proper name of one of his children. And most disturbingly of all, that that child is the very self-same rebellious Elohim, rebellious angel who was cast down to earth, that same wicked servant who stole the wine press, who stole the vineyards from its true owner who was God. And so, because Satan leads the whole world astray and holds the whole world in his sway, how could it be that billions of people around the world are worshipping the correct God? If that were true, Satan doesn't hold the whole world in his sway. He has not led the whole world astray. He has not blinded the minds of men and prevented them from seeing the truth of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect image of God, El Elyon. And so, the God that is worshipped in the synagogues of Satan around the world is not God, right? It's the synagogue of Satan. Says Jesus said, the synagogue of Satan who pretend they are Jews but are not, and many people have clung on to that and say, oh, it's anti-Semitic, then it's, it's the Jews that are the problem. No, synagogue was the word that Jesus would have used for what we would call a church or a temple. He didn't call it a church. He went to synagogue. So when he says synagogue, he's not specifying the Jews. He's specifying all false worship, all the churches of the world, all the mosques that worship Allah, all of the papists who worship the Catholic Church or call the Pope Heavenly Father, despite the fact that the Bible says you shall not call yourself Father or Master, but two billion Catholics call the Pope Holy Father, which is a title that only belongs to God. Who would usurp the proper title of God? Satan. So the two billion Catholics who worship the Holy Father, they worship the man of lawlessness described in the Bible who sets himself up in the holy place, claiming for himself all the names and titles of God. There are many antichrists, and there is one antichrist. It says, Believe not every spirit that claims to have the Spirit of God, for there are many spirits of antichrists that have already gone out into the world, and they are already at work in the world, even in the time of Jesus Christ. Many wolves in sheep's clothing, many false prophets, many spirits of antichrists, many who have been de deceived by the doctrines of demons. Right? And so two billion papists worship a false God in the form of the Pope, who is a spirit of the Antichrist. 
and two billion Muslims worship a false prophet in Muhammad who is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Outwards white as snow, if you could even say that of Muhammad, but inward like a ravening wolf. So there you have four billion people in the power of Satan, two billion Catholics, two billion Muslims. How many more of them worship idols, Hindu idols that are nothing more than the fallen angels who followed Satan into rebellion against God? All of the various gods of the world, they're not simply statues. Those statues exist as repositories of spiritual energy. Where does that spiritual energy go? It goes to the fallen angels who followed Satan in rebellion. For just as Satan wanted Jesus to worship him as God, so the 33% of the other Elohim who followed him in rebellion also wish to be nourished by the worship that is due only to El Elyon. And so all of the various pagan gods, the various satanic deities, the demons worship either as demons or in other forms unknowingly, all worship that does not go to Jesus Christ and to El Elyon goes to the devil and the fallen angels. There is no alternative. All the gods of this world are subordinate to Satan, who is the god of this world, but all of them are cast down from heaven to earth. There are no gods that are worthy of our worship in this world. The only god that is worthy of our worship dwells in heaven in unapproachable light. But he loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to earth to save us, not only from our own sins, but from the persecution and imprisonment of the devil and the fallen angels. So Jesus died to save us from a false god, to pay a blood price that was never demanded by our god, El Elyon. El is known as El the Compassionate, El the Merciful. None of the laws in Leviticus, none of the laws in the Old Testament, such as circumcision, blood sacrifice, Sharia law, stoning the adulterer, killing the homosexual, offering a blood sacrifice of innocent life, none of this came from El Elyon, El the Compassionate. These were the laws of Satan. These were the laws of the great red dragon who holds the whole world in his sway. And so... God did not, people say, why would God make a law and then we, pun we fail to, pit, to follow the law and then he kills his own son to pay the price that he demanded of us? None of that makes any sense. No, of course it doesn't. But because Satan was cast down to earth with the fallen angels, he enacted these evil laws on his children who he did not love. They're not his children at all. They're his possessions that he stole from El. If you kidnap someone else's child, do you love that child the way the parent did? No. So what happens to children who are kidnapped from their parents? Are they usually treated very well by the people who kidnap them? No, they might be tortured, they might be raped, even worse things might happen to them. Well, all of us, my friends, we were kidnapped from our God, El, because we are the grapes, right? We are the grapes in the vineyard that Satan stole from El. The false god of this world stole the vineyard and all the grapes, and we are those grapes. When we died, our souls were supposed to return to El, where we could have gone into our heavenly abode. But because Satan controlled the world and made these laws and enacted them, he was keeping us in this torture chamber called Earth for whatever sinister reasons of his own, perhaps to give himself sustenance after he was cut off from whatever sustenance the Elohim enjoyed in heaven, unable to drink the pure waters of life that flow from the throne of God. He had to subsist on human blood instead. And so what used to be angels became demons and what used to become Elohim became children of the dragon. And so this is perhaps where the concept of reptilians come from, because what would the children of a dragon look like? We know that Satan is that great red dragon. So what would the children who are of his very same nature, right? The demons are not different from Satan. They were Elohim too. They were all children of God. So Satan and the fallen angels became dragon and dragon children, reptilians, demons, vampires, blood drinking beings who feed on blood so why does the old testament say mutilate your children circumcise them torture your babies and inflict pain on your newborns kill innocent animals and spread the blood and if you read it it says bring me virgins the god of the old testament demands virgin sacrifices of human beings he orders genocides he orders genital mutilations he orders rapes he orders horrible crimes that have nothing to do with a loving or merciful god and he writes horrible laws that have nothing to do with a loving or merciful God. And he never expected that El would send his own son to free us from those laws. 
But when Christ paid once and for all the penalties demanded of the false god of this world, he set those of us who chose to accept his free gift of salvation free from the penalties and obligations of what is called falsely, in a way, the law. And the gospel says the law engenders sin and death. Because when you make a law that you know cannot be followed, then the creation of the law creates the sin, right? If you tell people not to do things that they cannot help but to do, then the law itself creates the sin. Then you demand blood to pay the penalty of the crime. It's a horrible catch-22 inescapable trap, and Satan thought it was very clever and that it would last forever. But in his infinite wisdom and mercy and love and grace, God sent Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son to die, free us from Satan and destroy the works of the devil. And so again, what does this all have to do with Melchizedek? Well, Melchizedek, his name means my king is righteousness or my God is righteousness. So the God of Melchizedek is a righteous God. El Elyon is a righteous God. The God of this world is not a righteous God. The God who created the laws of Leviticus is not a righteous God. But the God of Melchizedek, who blessed the bread and wine for Abraham in the book of Genesis, is a righteous God. Now, us Christians are enormously blessed because the Levitical priests are the priests after the order of Aaron. Aaron, a human priesthood after the order of Leviticus, one of the twelve, the order of Levi. One of the twelve tribes of Judah, Jews was called the tribe of Levi. So 11 of the 12 tribes received a portion of the land, the livestock, and the fruits of the earth, like the vines and the various crops. One tribe, the Levites, were denied their portion, and instead they were set up as a priesthood. And so the other tribes would bring sacrifices to the altar of the false god of this world, the dragon, in his tabernacle, where he demanded blood with salted meat and flesh and virgins and gold to be brought to him all the things a dragon enjoys. He sat in his tabernacle and he said, go, bring me gold, bring me virgins, bring me blood, bring me salted meat. And they did, and the Levites served him, collecting for themselves a portion of the sacrifice for their own sustenance. So the Levites were parasites upon a parasite. The dragon is a parasite upon this earth, feeding on the blood and flesh of this world, and the Levites served the dragon, taking for themselves a portion of the blood and flesh of this world. But we are not under the Levitical priesthood of Aaron, a human priesthood and a fallen priesthood serving a wicked and fallen dragon. We have an eternal high priest called Jesus Christ. And because Jesus Christ rose from the grave and broke the bonds of death and hell to free us, right? He went down into hell and says in the New Testament, I create my church, the rock on which I create my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, what does it mean to say the gates of hell shall not prevail? Gates are a defensive fortification on a fortress, right? You have a big, strong gate to defend yourself from an invading army. So if hell has gates, hell is like a fortress locked from the inside against the outside. But Christ said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. So the church broke open the gates of hell. Why? To free the souls inside. So not only did Jesus die on the cross to save us who are trapped on earth, he went down into hell, right? And we can talk about what exactly hell is, but he went down into that underworld where the spirits were being kept and he freed them as well. That's when he broke the gates of hell. Then he rose again and broke the bonds of death. So before Satan had us trapped in the world where we would suffer, then trapped in death, which we could not escape, and then trapped in hell, which I imagine is even worse and where there would have been no escape. But Jesus came and saved us on earth, saved us from death, and saved us from hell, rose again, the ultimate victory, and then he ascended into heaven. And so because of this, Satan can no longer hold us. He cannot bind us in this world. He has no power over us in this world once we are freed by the blood of Christ. He cannot hold us in death once we are granted eternal life by believing in Christ. He cannot hold us in hell where we will never go because we will not perish. We shall never go into the lake of fire because we are saved. Our names are written in the book of life. We are covered in the blood of the lamb and written in the lamb's book of life. So he rose into heaven. But what, before he went to heaven, he said, I go now back to my father in heaven to prepare a place for you. For in my father's house, there are many mansions. So he gave us also the good news. That's why the gospel is called the good news. Because the good news is, we're not going to die. We're not going to go to hell. 
we don't need to be afraid of demons. We are not need to be worried about sins. We're forgiven for our sins. We're not going into the lake of fire. We have authority over Satan and all the fallen angels. We can trample on scorpions and not be stung. We can rebuke all the powers of Satan. They tremble at the name of Jesus Christ. And we and the apostles, through the apostolic succession, right, ever since the time of the apostles who received the Holy Spirit from Jesus Christ, he said, go forth into the earth, heal the sick and cast out demons. Nothing shall hurt you. And they came back in great joy and said, Jesus, it's amazing. Even the demons flee at your name, the power you've given us. We can even cast out the demons. And through the apostolic succession, ever since that day, Christians who are in contact with the Holy Spirit can trample over the powers of the fallen ones. Which is why it says in the Bible, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to El Elyon and he will draw near to you. Right? He will come into you and reside in your heart. Jesus Christ will reside in your heart, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. Why does he flee from you if he's the God of this world? Because he's not really the God of this world anymore. He used to have power over everyone in this world. Now he only has power over those who give it to him. Those who sell their souls, literally or metaphorically, in exchange for the worldly pleasures and powers, money, sex, fame, drugs, rock and roll. He has power over them. But those of us who reject this world and choose to follow the true God, El Elyon, he has no power over us. Not in this world, not in any other world. That's why he flees from us. He has no choice. Because we can rebuke him. We can cast him down. That's why when Jesus came, they said, Oh, son of man, son of God, what do you want from us? Have you come to cast us out? Please, please don't cast us out. Because they knew that he was. they were absolutely powerless in the face of Christ. And they're absolutely powerless in the face of Christians. True Christians. Not false Christians misled into worshiping a false god, but true Christians bought at a high price with the blood of Christ. We have been ransomed, right? We're free now. And not only are we free, we have the keys to free others. And that's why Jesus said, go forth and spread the good news and the gospel to all the nations of the earth until nobody is left in the power of Satan. And only when the gospel has been spread to all of the ends of the earth and everyone who wanted to receive salvation has had the chance to do so, until that time, God will restrain himself in order to ensure that all the hostages who wish to be free shall be freed. So imagine you have a, a school, say, and in that school, there are many innocent children and maybe some not so innocent children, but still children. But there's also an evil school shooter, to use a relevant analogy from these times. You have the SWAT troopers who are God and his angels or Jesus and his angels. They're ready to go in and kill the school shooter, but the school shooter is holding all the kids hostage. So they're afraid that if they just break in and do it now, he's going to take all them with him. He's holding us all as hostages, human shields. So he sends in Jesus. to A better example I should have used instead of a school is a prison. So let me start again. This planet is a prison, right? It's Satan's prison. And Satan was the warden of this prison because he made it a prison. It wasn't supposed to be a prison, but he made it a prison. And so we were all human hostages being held by him, tortured by him, and kept as human hostages by him. And he thought, well, God can never come and take this prison from me. That I, He was originally a criminal, but he took it over and made himself the sicko warden, right? He said, well, God can't come and save all these hostages. I'll kill them all. I can't get me. I'll take them all down with me. What he never expected was that God would send his own son into the prison, an innocent man, to take a death penalty so that he could smuggle in the key out of the prison. That's why I said, I am the way and the truth, and nobody comes to the Father but through me, because the only way out of the prison is to follow Christ, because he knows the way in, and because he knows the way in, he knows the way back out. So if you follow the way that he came in, you go back out. That's why it says, broad is the way to destruction, and many go that way, but narrow is the way to salvation, and few find it, and only those who follow Christ can find it. So you can think of it as like a great jailbreak. I think there was even a show called Prison Break that had this very plot. There was one guy in prison who was innocent, his brother chose to go into the prison, even though he was innocent, so that he could break his brother out because he had planned an escape plan. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. Or you could think of it that Jesus smuggled in a key, but really it's more he had like an escape plan and he left doors unlocked. He broke in, left the doors unlocked and said, hey, follow me back out. I left the doors unlocked. You can get out. If you try and go at the gate that they say to go, you'll never get out. It's a trap. They say, oh, yeah, go this way. You'll get out. You'll get out. No, you just go deeper and deeper into the prison. Oh, serve me, Satan, and I'll give you money. I'll give you, oh, you go deeper and deeper into hell the more you serve the false god of this world. But when you serve this innocent prisoner, you actually get out through these back doors that he left open. So that was the original escape mission, a rescue plan. 
And once the gospel had been spread to all the world and everyone had the chance to accept Jesus Christ, which, by the way, is now. The gospel has been spread to all nations of the world in the English language as well as every other language. English is a universal language and you, everyone in the world basically can read it. And the gospel is available in the English language. And just as a side note, another, so gospel means good news, but it actually means good word, good word, good news. And it's also interesting to point out that Jesus was the word of God. And in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So the good word is the good news, the good news of salvation. And another word for the gospel is the evangelion. And the evangelion means the gospel of the angels. So when Christians spread the gospel, they're not spreading a human gospel. They're spreading an angelic gospel. And why? Well, when the shepherds, all the way back in the nativity story, were out in the field, a choir of angels appeared in the sky and said, Hosanna in the highest, uh, a king has been born unto you. Behold, a son is given, Emmanuel, which means God with us, Prince of Peace. Right. So the angels came preaching the gospel. And it's the same gospel we preach today. So before mankind preached the gospel, angels preached the gospel. And it's interesting to note that the root word of the word English, angli, is also the root word of the word angel. So the gospel of the angels, the good word in English, all derives from the same etymological root of angli. And I am, of course, an Anglican of the Church of England. So Anglican, English, angel, Angli all derives from the same and in the history of the human race there's only ever been one universal worldwide language the English language There was never one before it. it's the only one that's ever existed and in the English language in the King James Version of the Bible It's been spread to every nation of the world and of course translated into every local language as well So that prophecy has now been fulfilled the gospel of the angels has been spread to every nation in the world and everybody has heard of Jesus Christ and everybody has heard the good news that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life, which means the end times are now very much at hand because there is no more hostage situation. The only people who remain in sin are those who choose to remain in sin. The only people who remain unsaved are those who choose to remain unsaved. And the only ones remaining under the power of Satan are the ones who choose to remain in the power of Satan, which is why when Jesus returns, he doesn't come as a gentle prince of peace. He comes as a crowned and conquering king, making war against the nations of the earth. And it says he will not wear a white robe, he will wear a red robe. Well, why? Because his white robe has been stained red in the blood of his enemies. And the wrath of God is like a wine press. And a wine press, again, wine, is the blood of Christ. The grapes are human beings, and our blood is also wine. And it says the blood at that time will flow like wine from a wine press because God is going to slaughter basically everybody on the world at that time because all of those people are under the power of Satan at that time. There's... This is the parable of the wheat and the tares. So Jesus, his disciples came in the parable. The man said, Some, you, you sowed good seeds, but an evil soul, again, Satan, the false god of this world, scattered wicked seeds among the good seeds. What should we do? Should we rip them up? He said, don't rip them up because you might accidentally rip out some of the good ones trying to get the bad ones. We have to let things go their way. Once all the seeds mature, we can easily see which are the, the false weeds and which are the good wheats. So us humans, some of us are wheats and some of us are tares. Some of us are sheep and some of us are lambs. Some of us serve Satan, the God of this world, and some of us serve El Elyon, the God of heaven. And that is why when Jesus comes to judge the world in righteousness at the great white throne judgment, he will separate the lamb from the sheep. They look the same, but the lambs from the sheep, the sheep are his flock. He says, they, they are my flock. They know my voice and he knows us. He knows his children and his children know him. The goats are the children of the devil. They will go into the lake of fire, which is called the second death, and there they will be destroyed, annihilated, absolutely. The Bible says that the lake of fire is the second death, and that those who go there receive everlasting destruction. And destruction means to suffer so much damage that something ceases to exist. And so those who go into the lake of fire will cease to exist. When we die, we don't cease to exist. When I die and you die, we will not cease to exist because we will be preserved somewhere. Because when Jesus comes back, we will be resurrected in the flesh to face judgment at the great white throne. But once you go into the lake of fire, there is no further resurrection. That is a final end. The second death is permanent. The first death is more like a sleep that you'll wake up from. But the second death is absolute. And if you read the word destruction in English, yes, it says ceases to exist, which is clear enough. But if you read the original word in, in Greek, it says 
to absolutely annihilate be beyond even the shadow of memory, to leave not even the slightest trace, to completely cut off not only from existence, but the memory of existence. That's also why in the book of Revelation it says, God will wipe away after the salvific process of revelation and the eschatological process is complete. He will create a new heaven and a new earth, and it says he'll wipe away every tear. There'll be no more suffering, no more sorrow, and no more pain. And he says, the old things have passed away, nor, no, nor shall they ever more come to mind. So not, not only will the goats and the tares, the weeds and the, the demons and the, the sinners and the Satanists and the, the followers of the beast and those, they will, the, the followers of Satan, they will not only be gone, they'll never even be remembered. It'll be as though they never did exist in the first place. But that is the everlasting destruction of the lake of fire by which we are saved through the blood of Christ, those of us who receive it. And so there will be a new heaven and a new earth created. So... Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. You will end up loving one and hating the other, or hating one and loving the other. When we are at life now, we all serve two masters. That's the ancient thing. The devil on one shoulder, God on the other, or an angel on the other. When we live our lives, we're torn between our good and bad natures, and we go back and forth, and we're given a period of time to make our choices and try sin and taste the fruits of sin and see the consequences of sin see the harm we inflict on ourselves and others when we follow the urgings of the devil. And some people find they like that. They like to hurt other people. They like to hurt themselves. And other people feel the good it feels to improve themselves or to do good to others, to help the poor, help the sick. And they find they like that and they don't like the feeling of sin. And through this testing process, the wheats and the tares, the sheeps and the lambs separate themselves. It's not that God judges us and says, you're not worthy, you're worthy. No, we make a choice. We decide to follow the devil, the God of this world, or we decide to follow El Elyon, the God of heaven, and then there will be a judgment. And the judgment doesn't only come after death. Don't, don't rest in that and say, oh, as long as I repent before death, I'll be saved, because the great and terrible day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, like a ghost in the dark, and no man, not even the Son, but only the Father knows the hour. So it could happen right now. It could happen tonight. It could happen tomorrow. So those people who played themselves, oh, I'll just sin and sin and sin, and then I'll repent on my last day. No, God will come in great wrath, knowing the hypocrisy of your heart without warning, like a thief in the night. So there, that's why the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to repent of your sins. Today is the day to receive Jesus Christ into your heart. Today is the day to be baptized in the Holy Spirit in the name of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And now again, I keep winding around. What does all this have to do with Melchizedek? Well, we know exactly who Melchizedek was. His name means my king is righteousness, and he was the high priest and king. So he's very unique because in those days, you could be a high priest or you could be a king, but you could not be both. Only Melchizedek was both high priest and king until Jesus Christ, who is also both high priest and king. There's only been two people in history who were high priest and king. First was Melchizedek. Second was Jesus. And that's why Jesus Christ is described in the Bible as a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And Jesus is still alive, right? He didn't die. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He still lives and reigns at the right hand of God now. So we still have a living high priest, right? The Levitical priests are long dead, right? They're, they're all long dead. There is no third temple. There is no worship being offered. There is no Levitical priesthood offering sacrifices to, to Yahweh, animal sacrifices. There's no temple to do so. So the Levitical priesthood is dead and gone. But the priesthood of Melchizedek lives forever because we have a high priest who is eternal and intercedes for us at the right hand of God for all time. We have his authority for all time. We have his guidance for all time. And when Jesus went to heaven, he said, I'm going now, but I do not leave you leaderless. I do not leave you fatherless. I will send on to you the counselor who is the Holy Spirit, who will guide you into all truth and all wisdom and all righteousness, and who will reveal unto you everything that I would teach you were you to live with me. So when the apostles learned and followed Jesus, he taught them everything. He was the living God, Emmanuel, fully man and fully God, God in the flesh. And so they got to study and learn and live and laugh and love with God himself in the flesh. And you might think how unfair that we today, we don't get that experience. But we do. In fact, I would say what we have is an even better gift than living alongside Jesus Christ because we've been given the Holy Spirit. So everything that Jesus had, his power, his authority, his comfort, his love, his teachings, is available to all of us through an invisible, telepathic, mystic, supernatural entity called the Holy Spirit that connects each Christian to one another in the body of Christ, which is the only true universal church of God, not a building, 
not a synagogue, not a temple, not a denomination, not Catholic, not Orthodox, not Lutheran, not Presbyterian, not Baptist, not Anabaptist. The true and universal Church of God is the body of Christ, and all of us Christians are the members of that body. We are His hands and feet, we are His eyes, His mouth, His ears, and we are all supernaturally unified into one body, belonging one to the other, and all of us belonging to God, who is the head of the Church and the husband of the Church. The Church is the wife of the Lamb. The Church is the Bride of Christ, and we are the Church, so we are the Bride of Christ. I am the Bride of Christ. Any Christian is the Bride of Christ, because any true Christian is the Church, and we are married to Christ. And so, we are not separated from Christ, and therefore we are not separated from God, for Christ is the perfect image of God, and we also are made in the image of God, which is why God manifested as a human being. We also are in the perfect likeness of God. But Satan, the God of this world, has deceived the whole world. He's done this by falsely editing the Bible. And the greatest of his deceptions was to render the words that were proper names into titles like God or Lord. And not only that, to render multiple different names and titles into God or Lord. So in the Bible, there are multiple Elohim and God. El, as well as Elohim, who have different personal names, but the modern translations of the Bible have been intentionally corrupted to render these different names as God or Lord. This gives someone reading an English language translation enormous confusion because you have different entities being represented by the same character as G-O-D. One, we're deprived of the true name of God, which we need anyway, because it's very clear there's only one name under heaven by which we can be saved. It doesn't say there's only one title under heaven. It doesn't say there's only one word under heaven by which we can be saved says there's only one name under heaven, but most people don't know the name of God. They just know God or Lord. And they say, oh God this, oh God that, or oh Lord this. Well, that doesn't work. There's only one name under heaven. You can't just say God or Lord and be saved because God could refer to Vishnu, Ganesh, Shiva, Allah, uh, or Satan, all of which are gods with a lowercase d. So if you're praying to God, you might be praying to the devil or any of the demons. You need to know the true name of God. And also, it translates two different names into God, one of which is Yahweh and one of which is El. But these are not the same being. It is very clear from the Bible itself that these are not the same being, because in the Bible itself, it says, Yahweh was in the court of El. So Yahweh is one of the subordinate Elohim of El. This is obvious because we already know that God's name is El. That's why children of God are Elohim. And Yahweh is not El. So there's no Yahlohim or Yahwehlohim. That, that would be the, if Yahweh was God, then the children of God would be called the Yahwehlohim. But they're not. They're the Elohim. Yahweh is an Elohim. El is not a Yahwehlohim, right? So Yahweh is a child of El. El is the father of Yahweh, just like El is the father of all things. El is the universal father of all beings. He's, that's why Jesus said, my father, my father, my father, my father in heaven. Because all of our fathers is El. My father is El, your father is El, and Satan's father is El. But Satan was a rebellious son who tried to kill his own father to steal his, steal his authority. Right? And so what they did, these corrupt Satanists and followers of Satan and demons, is they rendered the name of God invisible by rendering it as God, but they also conflated Yahweh and El by translating both as God, and then they convinced everybody that Yahweh was God. But Yahweh is the dragon, right? He's the one who demands the blood sacrifice. He's the one who demands the human sacrifice. He's the one who demands infant genital mutilation. He's the one who demands genocide. He's the one who created the, the Levitical laws. He's the one who only cared about the Jews, but didn't care about them anyway, because he was constantly killing them and tormenting them more than anybody else and having them torment everybody else. So he didn't love the Jews and he loved everybody else even less. But El loves everybody. Jews and Gentiles alike. And that's why when Jesus, the son of El, came, the Gentiles were grafted onto the root of the Jesse tree. That's why it says the stone that the builder refused. Well, the builder is another word for the demiurge or the architect. The false god of this world is the builder. So the stone that the builder refused, the Gentiles, the ones he didn't even care to circumcise, he didn't even want them, he didn't choose them as a special possession, he wasn't given them as a special possession by El, they became the cornerstone. And the Gentiles, the Christians, right? the non-Jewish Christians who were grafted onto the root of the Jesse tree, which is Jesus, we, the stone that the builder refused to become the cornerstone. And that which was intended to be given to the Jews was given to us because they killed the Messiah who was sent to save them, and we accepted him. And so therefore their inheritance passed to us. And so they remain in service to the false god Yahweh, while we are now in service to the true god El. 
And what did the Jews do when the Son of God, El Elyon, came to preach the gospel? Well, first they tried to condemn him, they tried to trick him, they tried to trap him, they tried to accuse him. And remember, Satan's name is the accuser, right? And the law engenders sin, right? Oh, Theos started this whole conversation uh, by the work of the Holy Spirit, obviously, with a parable of the Sabbath gatherer. It's not a parable, it's a true story. The Sabbath gatherer is just some innocent guy was gathering firewood on the Sabbath, but because Yahweh, the dragon, had made this evil law, right, the evil law said you cannot work on the Sabbath. And so he broke the law. He was gathering firewood on the Sabbath. So what did Moses say? He said, kill him. And they put him to death, right? So that was the evil law of Yahweh, to kill a man just gathering firewood to keep himself warm because he broke the law, right? So Jesus also worked on the Sabbath, and he was also accused of working on the Sabbath. He healed the sick on the Sabbath. He healed the blind on the Sabbath. Right? And they said, oh, look, he's the Sabbath gatherer. We need to kill him, just like Moses killed this poor guy gathering wood, because we serve Yahweh. We serve the dragon. We serve the law. We're the Pharisees. We're the Sadducees. And that's why Jesus said, you den of vipers, you brood of snakes, who outwardly are white as snow, but inward are rotten sewers, rotten sepulchers, hypocrites, cancerous inside, because you have only the letter of the law, but know nothing of the spirit. Right? And so Jesus brought a true law, which was the law of grace. And he destroyed the false law of Yahweh and brought us into the covenant of grace, which is God's love for us. That's the only law is that God loves us. And as long as we accept that love, we shall be saved. That's called grace. No hundred Levitical laws that make no sense and are all evil and stupid and crazy and make no sense and nobody can follow them anyway. Just God loves you. And if you accept his love, you're saved. That's the covenant of grace that we're all under. No circumcision, no genital mutilation of children, no killing of wayward people who make mistakes or people who don't even mean to do something by accident. You know, Yahweh, they had the Ark of the Covenant and they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant and these Jews are doing their best and the guy stumbles and he accidentally puts his hand on the Ark of the Covenant. He kills him, strikes him dead. It was an accident, right? His own people, his own chosen people, he struck him dead for accidents. Whereas our God, El, will forgive us even for intentional sins. Even if we do horrible things, he loves us so much he'll forgive us as long as we accept his forgiveness. So there is no question of these being the same entity. It's, it's absurd to think that the same God wrote the Old Testament and then brought Jesus. The only way to understand the New Testament is that El Elyon sent Jesus Christ with this different gospel, this true gospel of grace, and the Pharisees, and the whole New Testament is just the same template over and over again. It's Jesus does something good, the evil Pharisees and Sadducees who serve the Levitical priesthood of Yahweh try and go, eh, we'll get him, we'll trick him, we'll trap him, we'll kill him, we'll accuse him. And Jesus is, is so brilliant and so perfect and so sinless that they just can't do it. He's such a seventh dimensional chess genius. No matter what they try, they can't get him. So finally, they just get him on no charge at all. And they, they demand that Pontius Pilate execute him on the cross. And Pontius Pilate says, for what crime? He's done absolutely nothing wrong. And they say, kill him, kill him, kill him. And he says, well, there's going to be a riot. I wash my hands of this. Let, and they go, let, let, let his blood be on us and our descendants forevermore. That's what it says in the, in the Bible. They killed innocent Jesus. Romans didn't want to do it, but the Pharisees and Chad, you forced him to. Why? Because they served Yahweh. They were enemies of El, right? And so they killed El, and it, they killed El's prophet and son. Just like, again, the parable of the vineyard. They sent his son, say, give me back my vineyard. They killed the son to try and seize the inheritance. The Yahwist Levitical priests and rabbis tried to kill Jesus to seize the inheritance of the earth. And indeed, they've still held on to it to this day to some extent. Satan still has this false power of the world in Hollywood and Washington, the Pentagon, and all the other bastions of evil power, the eye in the pyramid and the Illuminati and the shadow state and all these bogus bullshit that they're so proud of because they know their time is short. They're just grasping it. You know, so store out not your treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but store up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not destroy and thief does not break in and steal. So all the people who have sold out to Satan, they're holding gold in their hands, but that gold is just turning to shit and running through their fingers. Meanwhile, the meek shall inherit the earth. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Those who are poor and impoverished and have nothing in this world, they shall have the reward in full. Those who have received the reward in full in this world, they shall be the losers. They shall be the ones going to lake of fire or, or worse, right? They have nothing. And so, again, what does this all have to do with Melchizedek? So Melchizedek is the high priest of El Elyon. Therefore, we know, and we know beyond any doubt, it says clearly and repeatedly in the Bible that Jesus is a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So do you call yourself a Christian? If yes, 
who is Jesus that you say you follow? Well, Jesus is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Well, who is Melchizedek? And why have you never heard his name? Because it's been deceived. They knew that if you knew who Melchizedek was, you would know who Jesus was. And if you know who Melchizedek is, you know who Melchizedek's God is. And if you know who Melchizedek is, his God is El Elyon. So it's a very simple one plus one equals two equation. If my God is Jesus or my teacher is Jesus because I'm a Christian and Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek and Melchizedek worshiped El, then there's no big mystery here. It's not a big brain teaser. It's not like a Rubik's cube. It's not a, oh, difference of opinion, agree to disagree. I don't know. Nobody knows, right? No, we know fucking perfectly well. Sorry for swearing in church. Forgive me, God, right? I'm sorry. Try not to do that again. We know exactly who God is. It's El Elyon. We know exactly who Jesus' father was, El Elyon. We know exactly who it wasn't. It was never Yahweh. There, Melchizedek was not a priest of Yahweh, and Jesus was not a high priest after the order of Levi or Levit Leviticus. He was the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So two different priesthoods, two different gods, one of them the synagogue of Satan, one of them the priesthood forever of Jesus Christ, Melchizedek, and El Elyon. And so again, although Satan has deceived the whole world, it says, to those who walk in darkness has come a great light. And it says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. The darkness cannot extinguish it. The darkness cannot comprehend it, cannot extinguish it, cannot overcome it. That light was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. That's one of his titles. And by that light, we see the truth. So I hope now you begin to see the truth, the great deception that all the religions of the world follow the devil. There's only one true religion, the universal church of Jesus Christ, not the Catholic church, not the Orthodox church or any denomination of it. Simply those of us who worship God through the high priesthood. And when I say God, see, that's how they brainwash us to even say God. We were never supposed to say God. You wouldn't call me by a title, right? You call me by my name. Now Shogun is a title, but Shogun is my name here. So God never wanted us to call him God. He wanted us to call him El. He wanted us to know him. He's our father. Imagine if you had a father and you didn't know his name. What kind of father wouldn't tell his own children his name? What kind of father would say, just call me dad, but I'm not ever going to tell you my name. No, he wants to have a relationship with us. And you can't have a relationship with someone if you don't know their name. And you can't have a relationship with someone if you know them by the wrong name, especially if that is the name of some other person who's actually the adversary in Satan. The reason I bring you this message is because I've been called by God. I have had revelations from God. I had two. The first was that I was called to be a holy warrior in God's cause. That was my first mission, to be a holy warrior in God's cause. That was sent to me by the Holy Spirit and by God directly. The second one was from Jesus Christ directly. And that was to be a bearer of God's word, or more specifically, a word bearer. And when Jesus appeared, I I flattened myself on the ground and I cried and I wept and I flattened myself into the ground and I could feel his presence like his feet were right here in front of my face and I could reach out and touch him but I wouldn't look. I was literally trying to just melt away because I knew how utterly unworthy I was to be in the presence. I, I knew he's right there standing there and I was weeping and weeping and he was telling me exactly what he wanted me to do and he was saying, you know, Shogun, like he wasn't saying this, but I was saying, I was weeping and I was saying, yes, Jesus, by your sacred blood, I will bear your word. By your sacred blood, I will bear your word. Jesus, by your sacred blood, I will bear your word. Yes, Jesus, by your sacred blood, I will bear your word. And I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried. So that was the mission that I have to be a holy warrior for God and to be a bearer of the word of Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm trying to do right now is bear the word of Jesus Christ. And what that means is freeing you from the deception that has prevented you from knowing what Christianity is, who God is, who Jesus is, who Melchizedek is, and who he isn't. God is not Yahweh, okay? God never wrote the Levitical laws. He never ordained circumcision. He never thought of such a wicked concept as hell at all, right? Not only is hell is not in the Bible, but hell is not something God ever wanted. All he created was a prison for Satan and his angels. And the only way that you're gonna end up there is if you choose to follow Satan and the fallen angels, they want they know they're doomed and they want to bring as many of God's glorious children who were destined for the crown of eternal life with them into eternal perdition. And they're bringing an awful lot of souls with them into eternal perdition. The atheists, the Satanists, the Luciferians, the Muslims, the Hindus, the Jews, anybody who rejects the Messiah, Jesus Christ. I'm not saying you're all going to go to hell. No, no, fortunately not. None of those generally will go to hell, but you will go into everlasting destruction. You'll go into the lake of fire 
and you'll never be seen or heard of or thought of again. You'll never exist again, right? That's that's where they're bringing you down into perdition. And I wish that was as bad as it gets, but it gets worse. Because as these end times proceed, we will see the rise of the Antichrist, who is the beast. And the beast receives his authority from the dragon, who is Satan. Right now, Satan is still restrained, perhaps, for a time. I'm not even sure about that. I'm pretty sure he's already free. He was trapped in the abyss. He comes up from the abyss, right, from deep under the ocean. And the beast comes out onto the sea, right? The dragon comes out onto the sea. And he gives his authority to the beast, who is a man, who is the Antichrist. So the Antichrist will be revealed soon. And the Antichrist will receive his authority from the dragon who is Satan and be given power to perform miraculous signs and wonders. And because of those miraculous signs and wonders, the man of lawlessness, this is the mystery of lawlessness, will be unveiled. The restrainer will be taken away, the mystery of lawlessness. The man of lawlessness will set himself up in the high place and claim for himself all the names and titles of God and utter all the wickedness and blasphemies. And he will create a one world government and rule for 42 months. And many, many people, everyone basically, will worship him as God. And he will order that everybody receive the mark of the beast in the right hand or the forehead, without which they cannot buy or sell. And these people will be the ones who inherit the full cup of the wrath of God. They will drink it to the full. And therefore, when finally Jesus comes as crowned and conquering king and destroys Satan and all the wicked nations of the earth, he will cast the beast, Satan, and the false prophet in the lake of fire to suffer eternal torment. But... All the human beings who receive the mark of the beast and worship the image of the beast will also be tormented forever and ever in the lake of fire. And they will never die. They will seek death and shall not find it, have no rest, neither day nor night. So my message for you is a few things here. One, know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. But what they never tell you, they tell you he's your Lord and Savior. They never tell you he's your high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's what they hide from you. They don't even let you know that Melchizedek exists, and they certainly don't let you know that Melchizedek never worshipped Yahweh, but only worshipped El. They certainly never let you know that Yahweh was one of the Elohim, and they certainly don't let you know that Yahweh was the Elohim who was cast down and stole the vineyard, that he is the wicked servant who killed the Son of God who came to reclaim the vineyard, right? Because they want you to perish alongside them. Now, secondarily, I come here to tell you not to take the mark of the beast, so know your Savior, know your high priest, know that you have a high priest who lives and reigns at the right hand of God forever, and that you too are called to be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Not a high priest, I'm sorry, a priest. So Jesus, Melchizedek is high priest and king. Jesus is high priest and king. And all Christians are called to be a priestly and kingly people. So each of us, I am a priest, right? As a Christian, I am a priest and I am a king. And if you receive salvation through Christ, through the order of Melchizedek, through El Elyon, you too will become a priest and king, okay? And then we will help advance the kingdom of heaven. And I just want to clarify one more important thing. The kingdom of heaven and heaven are not the same thing. You think, oh, well, if you're a bad person, you go to hell and you burn forever in hell for a million years, forever, and hell is the domain of Satan. And if you're good, you go to heaven and you get wings and a halo and a harp and he heaven is the domain of God. No, yes, heaven is the domain of God and the loyal angels. There is no hell, doesn't exist. Satan and the fallen angels rule earth. So therefore, the closest thing to exist, or actually hell itself, is earth, where we are now. Jesus came into hell, where we are now, this earth, to save us, right? And into the underworld, Sheol. But in the future, when we receive salvation, we won't go to heaven, get harps and wings. No, we'll be resurrected in the flesh on earth to face the great white throat judgment of Jesus Christ. And we'll receive eternal life, and Jesus will rule as king over earth. So what that means is the kingdom of heaven has come to earth because now the authority of El Elyon reigns on earth instead of the authority of Satan. So the kingdom of England, right? They said that a kingdom is another word for like an empire. An empire is a kingdom, a kingdom is an empire. These words are for dominions. So people mistake kingdom of heaven for heaven. It makes no sense at all. Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It doesn't say heaven come to earth or earth go to heaven. It says the kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven, as it will also remain in heaven, so it shall also be on earth. Earth will still remain separate from heaven, but the dominion of the true God, El Elyon, will come to earth. And Jesus will rule over earth, and we will live alongside Jesus Christ. And we will meet him and live with him and walk with him just like the apostles did. And we will never die. And the earth will not be this difficult place where the sun burns our skin and we age and we waste away. No, it will be like the Garden of Eden, the way that it was intended to be. If God intended humans to live in heaven, he would have made Adam and Eve in heaven. But he didn't. He made this earth for humans. 
this is our home. It was intended to be this great blessing. It was all thwarted by the entrance of sin and the devil and Satan and serpent and the corruption of God's plan. But in the end, God is the greatest of planners, right? And that's a Muslim term, but it's true. God is the greatest of planners, right? He gets the last word. He plays the last card. So imagine you're playing a game of, I don't know, you guys play Hearthstone or Magic the Gathering, and it, like, it looks like you're losing and you're losing, and you're down to one life, and it looks like the other guy's winning, and he's got 100 life, and it looks like you're going to lose, but you play the last card, and it's like reverse or uno or whatever, right? He's got the last card. So in the end, the apparent victor becomes the loser, and the apparent loser becomes the winner because God is the alpha, the beginning, and the omega, the end. He gets the first word, and he gets the last word. So don't be deceived by the appearances of the things that are now. Say, like, I want to be on the winning team. It looks like the atheists are winning. It looks like the sinners are winning. It looks like the Satanists are winning. It looks like the Freemasons are winning. It looks like the Illuminati is winning. It looks like the people with the mark of the beast are doing better than the people who don't get the mark of the beast. Because believe me, the people without the mark of the beast, we're going to be persecuted. We're going to be tortured. We're not going to be able to buy or sell. We're going to be getting beheaded. And we're going to be getting killed. We're going to be starving. We're going to be persecuted and tortured. So everyone's going to say, well, I don't want that, and they're going to take the mark of the beast. But that's falling for the appearance. The appearance, the deception of the God of this world who's led the whole world astray and blinded us. You need to see with your soul. You need to see with the eyes of faith. You need to know the truth. And please remember the greatest gift of all, just like the worst thing that can happen to you is to receive the mark of the beast and go with Satan into the lake of fire and suffer with him his eternal fate of torment. The best thing that can happen is to receive the mark of the lamb. You've all heard people talk about the mark of the beast, but nobody talks about the mark of the lamb. Well, the events of tribulation do not begin until the lamb has marked his chosen people. Just like Satan marks with the mark of the beast, not the people he loves, but just the people he steals their souls and brings with him into hell. Jesus marks his chosen ones with the mark of the lamb. And once we've been marked with the mark of the lamb, we can receive eternal life and we'll come back, you know, as saints in the first resurrection, actually. There's actually two resurrections and that's we'll actually live and reign with Jesus Christ. But furthermore, um, it says in the Bible, there will the dragon will wage war against the saints and against the Lamb, and those who are with the Lamb will be called, chosen, and faithful. So the best thing you could possibly wish for, my deepest prayer, and I know now that it's already answered, I, I don't need to pray it anymore, it's already been done, is to be with the Lamb, called, chosen, and faithful, a soldier of El Elyon against Satan, the god of this world. And yeah, we'll lay down our lives, right? We'll have to die. But by doing so, Jesus says, he who loses his life for my sake shall gain it. He who seeks to gain his life or save his life shall lose it. So all God asks is that you die for him, just like he died for you. And he will raise you up, just like he raised his son up. And he will give you eternal life, just like his son reigns and lives forever. And Jesus says, those who overcome in my name shall be granted to reign at the right hand of my throne, just like I reign at at the right hand of God's throne when I overcame in his name. So that's going to conclude this sermon, if you want to call it that. And all I want you to know is the name of your God is El Elyon, and he loves you. He created the heavens and the earth, and his son, the word of God, Jesus Christ, was with him in the beginning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and indeed Jesus is God, right? Jesus is actually God. And says, by the word, by Jesus Christ, was everything created, and without him, not anything made was created, or without him, not anything created was made. So Jesus is the creator. Jesus is El. El is Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God and God himself. But remember, God is not some generic word that just applies to whatever willy-nilly. No, there's only one God, El Elyon. There is only one intercessor for mankind, Jesus Christ. And the only way you can know or connect to either of them is through the Holy Spirit. So this is the mystery of godliness and the mystery of lawlessness. You cannot serve two masters. So make your choice wisely, because at the end of the day, you're either a child of godliness or a child of lawlessness, a child of El Elyon or a child of Satan, a child of grace or a child of law. Choose wisely, and whatever you do, do not take the mark of the beast. Thank you so much for listening. It really means a lot to me that you guys were here. Not only that, it means a lot to God that you were here. It means a lot to El because there are no accidents in this world. There are no coincidences. Every single member of this server was called here. The name of the server, the Temple Mount, the whole story of the server, every single one of you was called here by God. 
Indeed, I believe that every single one of you were called here because God is calling you to be those marked by the blood of the Lamb, not those marked by the blood of the beast. Satan has his army and God is gathering his, and I believe that is the purpose of the Temple Mount, is to serve as a, a muster point, a gathering place for those who will be with the Lamb, who will be called, chosen, and faithful. That is the true secret mystery of this place. That is the true secret purpose of God. I never created this server. I didn't create the round table. I didn't create this server. I'm just a servant. I'm just a servant. I'm a slave of Christ. I just do what I'm told, what the Holy Spirit tells me to do. I could never have foreseen any of this. Not in my wildest imaginations could I have imagined how this would happen. I had no idea. Never planned any of it. God is the one planning it. And that means that every single one of you is part of the plan of God. Every single one of you was called here. And every single one of you answered the call so that you could hear these words. So let these words sink into your heart. Don't let this message pass you by. Don't turn your back on it. Don't convince yourself it isn't true because God is calling you right now to try and save you from the lake of fire because he wants you to have eternal life and he wants you to live and reign forever with Jesus Christ on a perfected earth. And that day is coming very soon. Great and terrible day of the Lord. So we need to keep ourselves in readiness. We need to repent of our sins. We need to confess them to God and we need to repent. We need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We need to be born again and we need to become sanctified. Because the Bible says, Of this I am confident, that he who began a good work in you shall see it through onto completion on the day of Jesus Christ. So where, whether you are just beginning on your journey of faith or whether you are far advanced, you are promised that as long as you are faithful to follow the call, God will complete his perfection of you by the time Jesus comes. So that when you see Jesus, he's not going to see you in the fallen state that you're in now. He's going to see you as the perfect creature he wants you to be. And then when you meet Jesus, you're not going to have to be ashamed of your sins. You're not going to have to be ashamed of anything. He's just going to embrace you. And that's all he wants. So, thank you for listening. Hallelujah. Hosanna of the Most High, Hosanna in the highest. Now I'd just like to close in prayer. Heavenly Father God, El Elyon, in the name of your Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit descend into the Temple Mount Discord server, into this chat room, into the souls of every person, into our midst and amongst us, God. Grant us discernment to understand what has been said and what should be received. Put on us the full armor of God, and we pray and plead the precious name and blood of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now there's one last thing I need to say. The Bible says, do not believe every spirit. For many spirits of Antichrist and many false prophets have gone out into the world. Don't believe everybody who says they have the spirit of God. He says, you have to test the spirits. You have to test my spirit. Because I'm speaking to you like maybe I have the Spirit of God in me. So you have to test me in case I'm an antichrist or I'm a false prophet. Because I could be. There's many of them out there. The Bible tells us how to do that. It says, no false prophet, no spirit of the antichrist will testify that Jesus Christ came in the flesh for the salvation of your sins. So I'm here to testify to you right now that Jesus Christ came in the flesh for the salvation of your sins. That being said, thank you very much. It means the world to me that you listened and that you stayed and that you heard this. I love each and every one of you. And that's going to conclude this meeting of the Church of the Mount. And this isn't the end. This is just the beginning. This is just laying the foundation stone because any other Church of the Mount podcast or church meeting we have from this point is building on this foundation because without this solid foundation, we can build nothing at all. The Bible says if you build on a rock-solid foundation, your house shall not be moved. But if you build on shifting sands your house is going to fall like a house of cards. So let this church service be the foundation. And if you thought there was some truth in this room, if it spoke to you on any level, then come again next Sabbath day and next Sabbath day, every Saturday, not Sunday, every Saturday, we will be meeting here to pray, to worship, to comfort each other, to read psalms and hymns, to study the word of God, to pray for each other and with each other and commune with the Holy Spirit and with one another and with God, and with Jesus Christ, our High Priest, after the order of Melchizedek. That's why the name of this, this meeting was the Ancient Order of Melchizedek, because what we have here is the, we are the Ancient Order of Melchizedek. We never went away. We've always been here in secrecy, concealed in the opinion of the wing of God. 
But the Bible says there's a time to conceal a thing and there's a time to shout it from the host tops. So the time has come to shout it from the host tops. So the secret ancient order of Melchizedek has now been revealed right here, right now. And all of you are invited to be part of it. So I want you to pray, ask the Holy Spirit whether or not you should accept that offer. And I hope you do. And if you do, I'll see you here next Saturday. In Jesus' name, good night.